Hello and welcome to What the Tech from Boast AI, where we talk with some of the brilliant minds behind new and exciting tech initiatives to learn what it takes to tackle technological uncertainty and eventually change the world. Today's podcast is a very, very special episode of What the Tech, as I'm positively stoked to feature Boast's very own co-founder and community builder extraordinaire, Lloyd Lobo, onto the show. Along with being one of the original brains behind Boast, Lloyd is also the founder of Traction, a community empowering over 100,000 innovators through connections, content, and capital. The community-led business model Lloyd spearheaded both here and at Traction was key to bootstrapping Boast in our early days, eventually building a business with eight-figure revenue while securing over $100 million in funding. Lloyd tells this story as well as other community-first founder strategies in his new book, From Grassroots to Greatness, 13 Rules to Build Iconic Brands with Community-Led Growth, which features tactical advice from businesses both big and small, including Apple, Harley-Davidson, Nike, CrossFit, HubSpot, and many, many more. It's a must-read. And of course, any podcast featuring Lloyd is a must-listen. I can't wait to hear from him directly about what it takes, what it was like building Boast in tandem with the massive traction community, his process for writing his first book, and his advice for founders navigating the startup scene in 2023. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Lloyd. How's it going, man? The pressure is on, my man. I am super pumped, but you know what? <laughs> you, you put the pressure on. That's quite the intro. Oh yeah, dude. No, I mean, you, you've done it. You've seen it. We've seen it. You built this community for us. It's long overdue to have you on this show. Honestly, Lloyd, I'm super excited to be here. I think it's a safe bet that many folks in our audience today probably know a little bit about your background since again, you're part of the DNA here at Boast, but I'd love from here to hear from you first off, where are you based? What's your background? What are your passions? And how did you get into building these communities in the first place? So my Currently, I'm based in Dubai. So after I left the day-to-day -day at Boast last August, after the la last Traction Conf we did, disconnected, moved to Dubai with a family, just wanted to experience a different part of the world where people choose to live and work a little different. Now, my journey actually ties to the Middle East in many ways. I was born in Kuwait, refugee of the Gulf War. And that was my first experience with entrepreneurship and community building in many ways, right? So what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship doesn't necessarily mean building and scaling a company. We talk about the entrepreneurial spirit. What that means to me is taking an obscure idea and turning it into execution and impact while dealing with extreme uncertainty and risk. And there was no worse uncertainty and risk than being a refugee of the Gulf War. So one morning in, in fourth grade, one summer morning, my mom wakes me up and says, hey, you can't go to school anymore. A war has been hit. Now, my first reaction was excitement because I was pretty sure I'd failed fourth grade because right before the holidays, I, you know, I, I have this maybe reading disability or whatever you want to call it. I procrastinate on anything reading, writing. So I ended up studying for a math exam, show up, it's a geography exam. So when my mom wakes me up that morning, I said, yes, you're never going to find out huh. that I failed fourth grade. That was my first reaction. But when things started to sink in, I saw this worry on their face and stress. And I'm like, okay, things are getting real. And I don't know what it is, but let's find out. So that day I go down the building with my dad. And you know, in, in 2023, bad news perpetuates, we belabor on negative negativity. But back then, as soon as we saw other people, rather than thinking about what worse is going to happen, they started saying, you know what? We don't have security. There's no phones. There's, there's no connectivity. How do we help each other? And somebody came up with, hey, I'll guard the building from 6 to 12. And somebody else said, I'll guard the building from, you know, from 12 to 6. Another person said, I'll organize food supplies. Somebody said, hey, we have family members that have been displaced. And others were like, hey, we have extra room. And, and what happened that day was I experienced something really interesting is the power of people coming together. Every building became a sub-community and word of mouth from building to building to building spread. Literally, we were walking from building to building to talk to each other. And it turned into one of the largest grassroots evacuation movements that took the people to safety. They communicated with embassies, with governments, and organized buses for us to go from Kuwait to Baghdad to Jordan, lived in refugee camps, and then eventually make our way out of there. That was a time when the security in the country had fully lapsed. And it was chaos. There were bombings, there were lootings. It was, it was insanity. But that day, I, I understood 
two very important things. One is the power of people in coming together against a cause towards a cause or a purpose that transcends individual gain. And then the second thing was this dealing with risk and uncertainty to take an idea to execution. And that drove me throughout my, my career. And a few years later, we ended up moving to Canada, my family and I, and um, I got into engineering school. And that's where I met Alex. Alex and I were great friends and partners in every project through software engineering program in university. I would be the front person. He'd build all the back end. We had a great relationship. And um, when we graduated, Alex got into Johnson & Johnson's engineering leadership program. They picked like two per country. And uh, I went into working at small company startups. The first job I actually ended up taking was in cold calling at a tech company. And my Indian parents lost it. They're like, man, you went to school to study software engineering and you're cold calling at this company. It's so embarrassing. Our friends' kids are at Microsoft and everything else. And what had happened was, you know, I had this affinity towards risk and uncertainty and I had asked a business person in the family, what's the best skill I could learn if I wanted to be an entrepreneur someday? And he said, sales. Sales is everything. Sales fixes everything. And I'm like, what does that mean? And he said, from convincing your family that you know, you're know you not going to bring money to convincing early customers, to convincing your employees and evangelizing them, to investors, to talking to the press, everything you do is going to be selling its communication and he and he said to me if you suck at the skill right at, at communicating the only way to learn it is to put yourself in a situation that requires you to do it over and over and over again see now we these days we talk to a lot of people who say i, I suck at writing or you know i don't you know i would love to build my linkedin profile but what they do, they never post. They post once a week, once a month, almost never post, right? If you suck at something and you never do it, then you'll never get good at it, right? Jason Lemkin wrote the forward on my book and his, his key quote was, consistency is the secret ingredient that turns small actions into big outcomes. And what that means is when Jason Lemkin left his company, EchoSign, after he sold it, he started writing very consistently for Quora, almost like two, three posts a day, he would see the questions and he wrote that for a couple of years and then eventually moved that content to blog and LinkedIn. He still consistently writes two to three posts a day. Consistency over time, the compound interest on consistency over time is what we call overnight success. And so I said, I'm going to find a job then in sales. I started applying to only sales jobs. I don't think I applied to even a single engineering job. And obviously, nobody wants an awkward engineer as an AE in their company, right? So I begged my way into getting a job in cold calling at a small company, which started as, you know, I applied for a customer service job or a technical support job, and I finagled into cold calling. And I still remember, man, like the first cold call I made, I practiced for four hours and finally, when the DM, the decision maker came on the line, I hung up and everyone around me was laughing. Lloyd, I, I can fully relate to that, especially the point about consistency. So a little bit about me. I went to school for journalism. I had crazy social anxiety when I started that. I really liked writing, interviewing people, not my strong suit. I went and became a bartender. I went and started waiting tables. I basically forced myself to talk to people day to day as much as I could. Years later, here I am hosting a podcast and I have you on the line and it's fantastic. But yeah, I can definitely attest to that. Consistency is key and that's how you build up that skill set. And even going back to, to sales being everything. On the marketing side, a lot of people don't like hearing that what you're ultimately doing at the end of the day is sales. Um, go to market and sales, they're together. It's all one big umbrella. But what you're doing on the marketing side is communicating for sales what the value is and getting that out the gate. So I loved hearing that. I love hearing that that's at the root of everything. I also loved hearing you talk about Jason and how he got into blogging every day. I'd love to bridge that into how you got into writing this book. Um, talking about basically, I know you had said that 
you had some maybe not learning um, challenges when you were younger, but writing might not have been your strong suit. How did you get into the process of actually pulling together these stories and creating this new resource for founders? It was the hardest thing ever, right? And wow. what had, what had happened was, I don't think I can actually outline a single book that I read cover to cover. The few that I read were actually um, audio books that I would listen on CD-ROMs back in the day when I was in the sales career driving from location to location. So I've listened to a number of audio books, but I've never read a book cover to cover. So it was actually very hard for me to collate the information and, and read it. And, and you know, I wanted to get into why I wrote the book. So after I left the left the day to day at Boast, I ended up feeling quite lost, right? I mean, I had come into some money, so I should have been happy, but I ended up feeling quite lost. And I, as I reflected back, it was the first time in my life that I had felt like I was losing my community because my childhoods were spent in the slums of Mumbai, where my grand when my grandparents were, and my mom grew up. And despite having a small little home that would be a bathroom in today's sense for most people, 10 kids living in there, I'd have the most wonderful times of my childhood there, right? There was no public rest. There, there was no restroom in the house. So you had to go to a public washroom, puddles everywhere turned into ponds and we would be swimming in the ponds. Not every home had a TV. And so watching TV was a communal thing. And every summer when I'd leave Mumbai to go to Kuwait, I'd cry and I'd not want to leave. And then the Gulf War happened and that became my community. When I went into sales, everything I wanted to learn in sales came from HubSpot's community because I started Google searching and all the content I would find back in the day in 2005, six was from HubSpot's inbound marketing certification. I still remember Gary Vaynerchuk, another example of consistency. He had a video on HubSpot's inbound marketing program on, on video marketing or video content creation. And this is what, 2005, six, Gary Vay was a chubby young guy talking about creating video, how it's going to explode the future. And that bets played out for him, right? Really well. And he was running Wine TV. And so HubSpot's inbound marketing became my community. Then when we started Boast, the first thing we did was you know, um, dive into what you have experience with. It was cold calling, picking the phone, dialing for dollars. Yeah. And we tried calling like big companies and small and nobody would really talk to us. Imagine we're saying, give us your data and we'll get you money from the government for your R&D. Not a lot of people would talk to us. Then we said, okay, you know what? Let's start going to all these events. We started going to manufacturing events and construction tech events and all kinds of every industry that we serve, right? That does product development. We went to their events and we we couldn't resonate. We couldn't fit in with the tribe. And then we started going to the startup events in the community. We had started the company out of Calgary. So I was in San Francisco. Alex was in Calgary because his wife was articling there. And so I temporarily relocated. And so we started going to the Calgary community events and we felt, hey, this is our tribe. We're founders ourselves. We don't come from success, right? And, you know, we can resonate, we can talk to each other. And as we started going to these events, we realized everything that was being talked about by the speakers were high level CEO platitudes. Mm -hmm. And that's not helpful to a founder at zero or one trying to get to one or five. And I think the reason that was, was because everyone organizing those events wasn't a founder, they were event organizers. And we said, aha, there is an opportunity here. We know other people from startups that we've been at and, you know, function of me being in Silicon Valley. Why don't we start hosting events? So our messaging quickly evolved from buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my shred, buy my R&D tax to, hey, founder, we're bringing CEO of a company at 5 million to talk about X topic, which was typically like how to get your first customers, how to test your first marketing channels, how to get your first angel investment, how to motivate your team, build, hire your first people when you don't have money, those kinds of things, zero to one, one to five things. And we got only 10 spots and there's going to be pizza. Would love for you to make it. And we'd hosted that assembly co-working space in Calgary. And the first meetup, 10 people showed up and more and more people started showing up. And that was great until one fine day, we did a launch with plug and play in 
in Silicon Valley. Plug and Play is a big incubator accelerator. And we had some talks and some pitches and 200 people showed up to the co-working space. That we had hijacked the whole, all the aisles in the co-working space. Yeah. And then the, the, the folks running the co-working space says, guys, you can't do this anymore. This is now like not a pizza night or a meetup. It's a full-blown conference. But you see what led up to that was also consistency, doing these meetups very, very consistently. The other thing we did unknowingly was, you know, today LinkedIn is huge. Podcasts are huge. YouTube is huge. Back in 2012, when we started, these channels weren't significant. Nobody was podcasting. Everyone was just blogging. And nobody was posting deep content on LinkedIn. And we said, if we build a blog ourselves, it's going to take ages to get the SEO juice, right? So I started hitting up the local newspaper, Calgary Herald, Post Media. And I'm like, listen, can you give me a column? I'll write startup of the week. I came up with the idea of startup of the week, 2012. And I said, I'll write every week. I promise you don't have to pay me. And did my best to convince them first wrote for some mid-tier blogs that weren't the newspaper, like wrote for um, some local blogs. Then I graduated and, and ended up writing a couple of blogs for, I think it was Tech Vibes, which, is, uh, which was acquired since and beta kit maybe. And then I shared with them and I'm like, hey, these are being shared all over. And then they gave me a column. And I kid you not, man, 2012 to maybe 2014, 15, I wrote start of the week, startup of the week every week for two and a half years. So the social proof, now think about it, right? This is in a community where startups weren't being given any love. No service provider wanted to service them. In fact, when Alex and I started the company, service providers or competitors would make fun of us. Like, oh, why are you going after the startup market? You guys are going to go bankrupt in six months. And we're like, you don't want to service them. We can't get to the clients you service. So it's yeah. like, we found our tribe. We're helping our tribe, right? And yep. I think the only way to win big is to have a contrarian view on the market and be right. We said, you know what? The startup market is going to grow exponentially, and it's going to leave behind manufacturing and other industries. And that's exactly what happened. Now, fast forward in 2023, all these competitors, these, these accounting firms, law firms, they all want to be run startup support programs. Hey, where were you in 2012? You weren't doing these things, right? And, and so it was driven by adding value to our tribe. That's how that community started. And the two channels we leveraged was in-person meetups, that today has evolved into traction and uh, the online content that we put on a third-party uh, newspaper website, Startup of the Week. The beauty of doing that was twofold. One, we got a lot of link juice from a high PR website. Yeah. And like I said, if we started a Startup of the Week on our blog, one, no one would read it and it would take years to build the SEO. So we said, if we put it on, on Calgary Herald, two things will happen. One will get the link juice from online. They promised to put it on print because the first one I wrote online got shared so much, right? Because think about what's happening now. As soon as a startup is featured in a paper, what are they going to do? Share with all their friends. They're going to run to the uh, to the aisles. The first thing it's going to be released every Monday, and they're going to pick a copy. They're going to they're going to tweet it, take photos, send it to people. It's a matter of pride, right? And so they they shared it with everyone, and the shareability let startup made startup Cal or rather Calgary Herald put it in the newspaper in in the print given the first first couple were shared so much and so we did that for two and a half three years and then of course got busy with both things got you know harder and the company scaled and I end up stop writing I stopped writing that column hindsight I should have continued <laughs> writing that <laughs> column that was early content creation, right? Early social proof creation. So some key lessons over there, taking a pause, you know, I'm going through the long journey of why I wrote the book, but some yeah. key lessons there for, for community builders or entrepreneurs wanting to build a community is if you want to build a community, step one is figure out if you have the DNA of giving. If you don't want to give people and you want to monetize on day one, you're better off trying direct response channels like sales, email, ads, whatever there is, right? If you want instant gratification, community is a labor of love. It's a marathon of the heart and mind, and it takes a long time to build. You don't see results on day one. It's this. It's literally this pattern, visibility, 
credibility and then profitability. You show up everywhere, which is what you're doing now, Paul. You show up everywhere. You rub shoulders with the right influencers. So you get their brand rub and by association, you become credible by virtue of providing value, you become credible, and then you drum up the noise and become profitable. So it takes a long time. But if if you have the DNA of giving and you want to go on this journey, the step one is figuring out your values, right? So Boast, when we first started reaching, we were reaching out saying, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. But when we landed on the ICP, we're like, this is our tribe, right? So step one is how do you land on your ICP? Three things. One is What is the size of the market and is it growing? Two is, what is their propensity to pay? And three, what is the ease of access? Like draw three columns and score it. Now, if you're in a massive market that's growing and they have a great propensity to pay, but if you have no ease of access, you're never going to get any customers, right? And so that's why we started there. Now, the next phase is you want to build a community. Say you pick a channel, right? Yeah, you you looked at a bunch of different channels and you said, you know, community is one I want to do. So if you want to do community, you got to figure out, do I have the values of a community? Mm-hmm. What are the values of a community? I write about this in the book. I come up with a six-step uh, framework called Camper. Connection, autonomy, mastery, purpose, energy, recognition. And, you know, it sounds cheesy, but if you implement Camper in your company, in your community you will have happy campers. And what that means is people crave connection. Nobody wants to be micromanaged. They want autonomy. If you try to control them, you'll kill your community. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to get better and better at what they do, mastery. Purpose, community transcends your profits, right? People are giving their time. They're volunteering in many cases. They're coming together for value. If they're coming just to fill your coffers, they're going to wither away. That won't last. And so the purpose is really important, a purpose that transcends your product or your service or your profits. Energy is key. Who knows that better than you? Look at the energy. You started with such great energy that you know you made you you yanked out the energy out of me. I've had a long day, right? And so energy is key. Like look at any leader, any any movement, any community. Energy is key. And the last one is recognition. No matter how big or small the help is, if you don't proactively recognize people, they're gonna feel like robots and not wanna show up. Right. So camper, Mm -hmm. having those camper values. The other thing is figuring out your purpose, which is your forever. What is my purpose that lasts beyond me or the company? What is the vision? Meaning what will the world look like as a function of my existence? And then the third one is the values, the values I talked about, the camper values. I wanted to start with the values because values are how you behave every waking hours, how you show up. So then the purpose went from automating tax credits or getting people money for tax credits to helping innovators change the world. Why did that happen? It's because we figured out our tribe and we understood their aspirations and their goals. Why do founders and innovators want any funding, let alone R&D funding, to grow their business? Why do they want to grow their business? Why do they want to invest in R&D? To create impact for themselves, for the world. And so our our purpose became enabling innovators to change the world. Every dollar spent in innovation returns 20 to the economy. Vaccines, robots, clean drinking water is a function of innovation. Yet in the last 20 years, more than you know, more in the last 15, 20 years, more than 50% of the Fortune 500 companies have evaporated because they don't innovate, right? Or they don't have the mechanism to. And 90% of the innovations and innovators, they die on the vine, right? So why Mm -hmm. is that? And so that became our why is helping innovators change the world. Because if you don't do that, the world won't exist. Then what was the vision accelerating innovation? As a function of our existence, what will happen is innovation will be accelerated in the world. So then what was the mission then? How do you do it? Through funding, and know-how. See, now think about it, right? Like there's this graphic that shows Mario, he eats the mushroom and he becomes Super Mario. They say the mushroom is not your product. Your product is Super Mario. Customers want an outcome. They don't want technology. They don't want software. Your job is to get them that outcome by any means possible, whether it's with your product or beyond it. But if you want to build something enduring, you got to help them get that outcome. You got to understand their aspiration. And so how did we do it? Not just through funding, 
but through know-how. And that's why we started building this community saying, yes, we do a great job getting our companies already tax credits, but if they don't have the know-how, they'll never succeed. They'll never know how to spend this money. And so we started creating and building all this content to help them become successful, which eventually evolved into the traction community, right? And then the last one were the values, which I which I talked about. And so that was the genesis of uh, of the traction community and how it uh, how it tied to boast. Love so many points you brought up in there that I think have really laid the groundwork for all the success we're experiencing today at Post. The DNA of giving. Every time I talk to a founder, they're happy to see us. That is so rare when you're in a marketing position and you're going up to people at shows and being like, hey, you're one of our customers. Can I get a quick testimonial? They already know who I am when we're coming because they know Boast. They recognize our brand and they understand that we've saddled up with them. We have worked closely with them for more than just that funding mechanism. Like you said, we're helping share that know-how. They recognize traction and they tie that to Boast too. But also just our teams, even our CD and CS teams, they partner up. They are founders in their own rights, many of them. Um, we have Aaliyah on the show often. She'll usually bring in a founder friendly who is a customer of ours, but also somebody who she's worked with on helping build a community and helping build an actual startup. So we practice what we preach. It makes my job easy when we're carpet bombing the shows and I'm trying to get some people to talk to me because they're happy to. They really love the work that we've done. They love the community that you've built up. And they want to be a testimonial for us. They want to be in our network because we get stuff done and we do good things. And um, it's exciting. And I cannot wait to actually get my hands on this book and to read through the whole camper philosophy and to see some of these graphics that you've actually mentioned here. Now, going closer to the book, in writing it, what would you say was maybe your biggest surprise or your biggest learning without giving away any spoilers? Because I do want people to buy a copy and not get it all here. But what would you say was... If not your biggest surprise, maybe biggest lesson. So, you know, I, I love what you shared, that the community philosophy, right? The one thing I want to sh share, we called it traction and not the boast community for a very specific reason. There's three types of communities you can build. There's a community of practice, which is bringing people together to learn about a specific skill or a craft that transcends your product or service. There's a community of product where people come together to learn about the product and became, become evangelists. And then there's the last one is a community of play where people come together to have fun, like a Harley Davidson community or Nike community, a community of product, maybe the Microsoft community or the Atlassian community. And a community of practice is like that HubSpot community where I learned everything about sales and marketing is the traction community. And we called it traction because that's the term that is everlasting, right? What do entrepreneurs, what do innovators want? They want traction. We couldn't have called it the boast community because if we called it the boast community, people would think they would be sold to. And here's a key learning. If you're starting out and you don't have customers or you have very few customers and you don't have product market fit, build a community of practice that transcends your product or service and you'll build that social proof. Because through that, what will happen is you'll build partnerships with key influencers, with key partners, and with press and journalists and everyone, you basically draw up the circle of influence around your ideal customers and you'll partner with them to deliver value to them. So that's what we did. So I wanted to, wanted to share. So then fast forward many, many years, we end up selling majority to Radiant Capital in 2020 during the pandemic when the, the, the community had opened up for in-person conferences. And the Radian Capital folks who had come to the event, they called me and said, hey, you know, I'd love for you to join our venture partner network. And uh, I said, hey, we have a business to run. I don't think I can do that. And they started inquiring what the business was and their jaws dropped and they wanted to invest. And we ended up doing a deal where they bought about 50 some odd percent of the company. And through that, you know, it was like a full circle, right? The community helped the social proof and everything. And the community also brought us the funding. And, and uh, you know, no better way for me to think that the entire journey from that spending my childhood in the slums to uh, the Gulf War, to the HubSpot community, to the traction community, and just the community around Boast was part of my DNA. And so when I left the day-to-day -day at Boast, I felt lost. I felt like, you know, I've, I'd lost my tribe and everything. And so as a way to pay homage to the community, I started writing the book when I had all this free time. And in that process, I started rewatching all the traction content. I talked to so many people, like the count is 
about a thousand or a little over over the past couple of years. And I looked into the guts of every iconic brand that exists. And I found a four-step common path that is the same journey for every obscure idea that became legendary or a worldwide phenomena from Christianity and Christ to CrossFit. People listen to you, you have an audience. You bring those people together to connect with one another, you have a community. When the community comes together to create impact that transcends your product or service or your profit, it becomes a movement. And then when that movement has unwavering faith in its beliefs through rituals, it becomes a religion or a cult. And so, you know, as I talk to more and more people asking the same questions, the only way to come up with a framework is to keep asking the same questions and draw out commonalities. I found 13 rules that were very common to all of them and how they went from obscure to iconic and uh, you know, decided to turn them into stories. And the way I wrote this book was the only way I know that's digestible to me, because as I said, it was very hard for me to read or write. And so I had to be able to consume it. So selfishly, I wrote it for me <laughs> in many ways. If people don't like it, I apologize, but I wrote it ah. for me. In, in many ways to get it out of the system. And the stories are intertwined. You start with unleashing camper and defining what camper is, then figuring out your why, then nailing your ICP. And it goes all the way to creating rituals and measuring and monetizing. And measuring and monetizing is the last chapter for that same reason that, you know, community is all about give, 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 and then eventually you'll get. This is my gift to the community in many ways. I'm here because of the community. And that's why I put the book for 99 cents. 99, I could have put it for free, but 99 cents only means that people can leave me a review. It'll be a verified review on Amazon. And, and that was my gift because we said we'll take a sabbatical for a year and not do traction conference this year. And so not being at Boast day to day and not hosting a traction conference and being in a place like Dubai, where everything is done for you in many ways, like it's a land of convenience, everything is done, delivered for you. I had a lot of time. So I said, you know, in, in my mind, I had never been in a situation where I had hours and hours of free time. So I said, this is the best use of my time is to put a book together and pay homage to the community and, and share some of my journey, but journey of some of the greatest brands, enduring brands in the world to show that technology will come and go right? We're in this age of generative AI. You see what's happening here is marketing is taking a bloodbath in 2023, right? Um, yep. CPMs are up, TikTok, socials, you name it. Uh, marketing is taking an absolute bloodbath. People are spending less and less on marketing. People, the consumers are tired of clickbait, of spam, of seeing the same thing over and over, sharing personal data to access crappy white papers. And generative AI, after the initial buzz, has created the sea of sameness. I can actually tell instantly if somebody copy pasted something from ChatGPT. So how do you differentiate? You know, if you if you see in a world increasingly influenced by artificial intelligence, the the key here with this book is to reignite the conversation around the unique power of authentic human connections in molding enduring brands. In the yeah. 80s, I mean, generative AI is the new wave, but technology and technological innovation has been there for generations. Mm -hmm. And when new technological innovation comes, always the old gets commoditized, right? Now we're talking about writers being commoditized and this and that, and you know, generative AI is going to commoditize the world. But this also happened in the 80s when the Japanese manufacturers came in and commoditized electronics. Harley Davidson almost went bankrupt in the 80s, okay? The management came out and said, we're going to rebuild the company on the ethos of community. Community wasn't a marketing strategy talked under the marketing team. Community became a company strategy. The leaders were required to go out in the community, start writer clubs, and bring people together and do bike rides and rallies. That's what they were required to do. Employees became writers. Writers became employees. Over time, they created a movement to save Harley. Not only that, they created movements to donate to breast cancer and autism, which transcended the Harley brand. Today, Harley is an iconic brand, right? You can see 
and recognize a Harley fan just by a function of what they're wearing. Yeah. And even to your point too, like there's so many charities that they get together. Um, I live here in Boston and there's a lot of biker rallies up in New Hampshire. So to hear Harley was even struggling in the eighties and didn't have that community from the get go. That's mind blowing. I didn't realize that. Um, and yeah, it's just such an identity now. And that's incredible. And you don't even think about Harley Davidson when you're thinking about those traditional tech conglomerates and you're talking about your Atlassians or your Microsofts and the different kinds of communities that they're building compared to the Harley Davidson more fun and lifestyle brand. But it was kind of tech encroachment that pushed them to explore that new community, correct? Innovation will always come. Yeah. And if you think about it, yesterday's innovation is always today's option and tomorrow's commodity. See the GPS, right? You couldn't get your hands yeah. on it. Then it became an option. Today, there's CarPlay. Cars are even not having inbuilt GPS. They're like, why build it and, and keep upgrading the firmware and the software? We'll just use CarPlay. So what does that tell you? Yesterday's innovation is always tomorrow's commodity. But if you build a community, you will never become a commodity. And that is the profound learning here with every iconic brand that almost went bankrupt like a Harley Davidson or could have lost its way. Why do you think Apple exists? Apple's mm -hmm. competitors don't you know, talk about the aspiration. Their competitors are always bashing Apple. But what mm -hmm. has Apple done historically? They talk about the aspiration, helping people become better creators, the goals, things that transcend their product or service. You look at Nike. Nike has running clubs all over the world. And I've explored brands, both B2B and D2C, to give a flavor. Because mm -hmm. we, what we do in B2B is we make this one fundamental mistake. We think B2B marketing is different than B2C marketing. What we don't realize, especially it's true in 2023, that people do business with people, technology aside, people do business with people. Let me ask you this. In your personal life, when you're scrolling, you know, doom scrolling on Instagram or TikTok or whatever channel, do you follow and consume content from people or from brands? People. People, of course. Every time. Even if they're associated with a brand, I almost, I can sniff out when the AI is playing too. That might just be me sitting from my marketing bench, but yeah, I can tell when it's being fudged. So yes. So that, that tells you right there, people yeah. buy from people. The other big trend, right, is this generative AI creating a sea of sameness. Yep. By 2024, Google is going to phase out third-party cookies. So owning your audience is going to be very key. And the, the platforms and short content has created a boom and an explosion of influencers and actually micro-influencers. The 10 to 100,000 follower category is the fastest growing. And what that tells you is like a Harley Davidson or like an Atlassian or like a HubSpot, we need to encourage our employees in our companies to become micro influencers and create their own communities, create their own audiences and, and give them, enable them to bring their audience and communities together. This is what Harley did. Look at HubSpot. HubSpot has an infinite number of influencers from within the company from back in the day when they started. Because the thing is, when you try to control top down that influence, it breaks because you can't police everything, right? You need to have guidelines, not not sort of uh, jail cells, right? Yeah. Or Atlassian. A perfect example is Atlassian. Last year, Atlassian's community self-organized 5,000 events. Now, that took them 20 years of consistency to get to that. But imagine, so now that means you have 5,000 fans who are 5,000 micro-influencers who on their own power without your support can bring people together. And let's assume the average event was even... 50 per people. So now you got, you've congregated 25,000 by just providing some love and care and, and light support versus having a events team of like hundreds of people, 5,000 events self-organized. How does that happen? Right? It's about giving your people the autonomy, identifying your super fans, showing them love, giving them the autonomy, giving them small budgets, because if you don't enable your own micro influencers in 2023 soon you'll be paying for others influence yeah. no that is an amazing point especially again like you said unique to 2023 but it's also lessons that we know from the past you just got to nurture those communities and i love the point you made too about 
there not being the distinction between B2B or B2C at the end of the day. And emphasizing again, it's about working with people. And I know you had said you started pulling together this book almost as a gift to your tribe and to the communities that you built in the past. This truly is a gift, Lloyd. Um, I'm excited to dive into it. I've already got my 99 cent copy. Do you want to let our listeners know where they can get their copy and when they can get a hard copy too? So the hard copy also you can buy. I'm going to put the paperbacks in a neck in the next week or so. It's just taken a long time. See, this is the function of somebody who's not traditionally written or read <laughs> anything significant. So my first biggest challenge with writing, right, was writing for Startup of the Week in the Calgary Herald. I would always end up writing it an hour before the deadline, submission <laughs> deadline, because it would stare me in the face. And I would take interviews and take down notes. Back in the day, there was no transcription or any of that in, in a big, easy way. And so writing this book was was hard like that. And, and you know, I <laughs> had to write and read it many times. And, and so a lot of changes happened along the way. So we put the digital copy it's on Amazon. We then put the hard copy as well. The hard copy is full color. There's beautiful images in there to mark each chapter. And then the paperback will also be full color. It'll come by the end of next week. So you can just go to from grassroots to greatness.com and that content will be there. And then we'll have a forward slash bonus because what I wanted to do is this, this book is written like a storybook in many ways. It's stories. It's, mm -hmm. it's conveyed through people's journeys and stories because that was the only way I could read it. I couldn't read a very academic book, yeah. and so I couldn't write one. But I said, every chapter will have an accompanying template. I'm like, you know, coming up with your values to figuring out your ICP or who to target or how to determine the right rituals. All of that, we'll put it in a Notion doc and we'll make it available for everyone who gets a copy of the book or not, right? We'll put it on from grassroots to greatness.com forward slash bonus in the next couple of weeks after the book is launched. So you can start implementing it, whether you buy a copy or not. Right. We'll have all of the links to everything that you need to get that access in the blog post here and in our show notes. But um, Lloyd, I, I know we're over time. I actually kind of lost track of the clock, but anything you want to throw in before we do a quick sign off? Thank you to everyone for being a big part of my journey. And uh, we are here today because of your love and, and your support, literally from two guys who are pounding the pavement, uh, trying to make calls and have those early conversations to today boast being a successful venture with 100 plus employees, funding and everything else. We couldn't have done it without the power of community. So truly, truly I'm thankful and you, the community has inspired me to write this book when I when I had time. And, and you know, what's, what's really interesting is, like I said, um, as I was going through on that rickety bus from Kuwait to Baghdad to Jordan, on the highway of death, when the bus was bombed, buses were being bombed and it was just chaos. When I looked around the bus, the adults were laughing and smiling and singing, playing Bollywood music and everything. And I realized that day that it's neither the destination nor the journey, but the companions that matter the most. You could be on a crappy journey on the way to hell and great companions make it memorable, right? And the other time I realized this is when I, when after we did the Radiant deal and I, I got COVID, I almost died. I was in the hospital and I realized, right, it's, it's never the money in your bank. It's the people around your tombstone that matter. And the only time in my life where I was down was when I felt the community was leaving me when I, when I left the day to day. And that was never the case that was in my mind. And so I wanted to say is wherever you go, build your community and they'll fuel your energy forever and they'll take you to new heights. Thank you so much for fueling mine. Lots of love. Beautiful words to end it on, Lloyd. I cannot thank you enough. And thank you so much for making this great company that I'm fortunate enough to continue building on. So I really appreciate it, Lloyd. And thank you again. Thank All you right. for driving the vision, my man.